We will move into our first panel discussion, taking up the theme that David has raised and the question of what is scientific truth. So if I can invite our panelists on stage, please. Peter Doherty, Helga Novotny, and Joseph Stiglitz, please. Peter? Joe at the end. Helga, if you could go in the middle there, please. Fantastic, let me pour you all waters. So, as you'll see from your program, the Nobel Week Dialogue is very much about this sort of discussion. And the day is mostly devoted to conversations between varying groups of participants. And this topic of scientific truth is one that we'll revisit in various forms throughout the day. We'll be talking about uncertainty and trust and evidence in panels later on. But for now, we just have a few minutes to talk about what scientific truth is, and perhaps to respond a little, I think we've, we're done, thank you. Uh, perhaps to respond a little to David's talk. So Peter, <coughs> David is of course a theoretical physicist. Uh, you are a biologist. Do you have any different view perhaps of scientific truth? Well, well not really. I mean, David's exposition was great because what it brings it back to is reality. I mean, what we're trying to do is deal with reality and understand reality. And reality is real. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. As a biomedical scientist, I'm interested in basic, I'm a disease and death person, a very cheerful position to be in. I work on infection and immunity. I'm concerned with cancer. And, and the realities are there. If you've got colon cancer, it's a reality. If you've got melanoma, it's a reality. If you have pancreatic cancer, it's a reality and you'll soon be dead. So we understand that. Truth is not a word that we use. I've, in 50 years, uh, as a biomedical science, I've never stood up in front of an audience and said, the truth is, what I say is our best understanding is that. Mm. Our, our, what the data tells us is that. Now, through that process that David discussed, which is the process of, uh, particularly in biomedical science, not so much big theory, as you have in physics, because you have the laws of physics. Evo biology is beset by evolution. And evolution is a process where, as, as creatures have, have become more complex, we've built on pre-existing structures. So it's, it's like an old house in Gothenburg that's built in the 16th century. And in the 20th century, you have to install plumbing. I mean, you, you're not doing it the ideal way. If we did it the ideal way, we'd have four hearts so we don't die of a heart attack, okay? Mm -hmm. But we don't do it that way. So, so basically, what we try to understand is that underlying reality of this particular situation. And often what we get to in science, in biomedical science, through experimentation, through testing, often through rather ad hoc type testing of late, with no great theoretical concept behind it, is, is a solution, or what looks like a partial solution. And the solution is whether you live or you die. Mm. And that's a pretty good solution for most of us. And we don't have a lot of quarrels with that. Even Mr. Trump doesn't quarrel with the idea of being live or dead. I mean, uh, um, I don't want to expand on that. But, um, uh, <laughs> but basically, often when we get a solution, we, we, don't, we don't fully understand what's happening when we move on. Mm -hmm. Because that problem is no longer a major issue for us. So, so that's, that's a kind of a, a bit different from the physicist who, who's got an overarching theory. And of course, in, in the end, everything comes back to the laws of physics. So, uh, Sorry, okay, well, that was beautiful. I, I, I hesitate to stop you. But, yes. um, so you're right, scientists may not use the term truth, but, the peop but people out there do all the time. And they equate scientific reality with scientific fact, and they want to hold on to scientific fact. Helga, Helga what's the relationship between fact and truth in science? Well, allow me to bring in perhaps a European perspective, uh, because we have heard very much about Donald Trump, and of course he also has an impact on what happens in the rest of the world. But from a European perspective, I was struck by the fact that in the American discourse, by and large, you speak about post-truth. And in Europe, we speak about post-fact. And <clears throat> there is a slight difference. Now, truth and facts are not the same. I think we, we agree on that. 
And it may have to do with the fact that you have creationism in the US, you have very little creationism in Europe, not worth to speak of. You have many more evangelicals, while Europe by and large thinks of itself and is a much more secular continent. And <clears throat> therefore, <clears throat> I, I think uh, we have to look also at the relationship between science and democracy. And what people, at least in Europe, in this post-factual age, are questioning is, and we have seen it in Britain, we see it in many other parts, is scientists are seen as being part of the establishment and part of the elite. Now, we are part of the elites, there's no question about it, but I think we have to, um, <clears throat> not to be over-defensive, now we have to stand up, you know, mm. and defend truths by saying every time this is scientific truth. Mm. I think <clears throat> we have to understand what people are really protesting against, why they feel left behind, and so on. And it is not that they are questioning, I mean, there are some, and I think they are mainly in the US, there are some <clears throat> that question scientific truths, but by and large, people want to dispute facts because they do not fit the context in which they live. Hmm. And <clears throat> part of the um, answer to David's very relevant question, how can we stand up to it? I think has to do with uh, trying to make sense of facts and put them into context, that people understand the context and can relate to the context. I know this will not solve all problems. There is always a minority that will continue. Liars can e cannot be convinced by any argument. We know all that. But I think one way forward would really be how can we bring science and democracy again closer together, because I think David is fully right. Science and democracies are allies, and without science, democracy will not progress at all, mm -hmm. and science needs democracy as a way to hold up the very strong belief in the freedom of inquiry. Mm -hmm. Without that belief, and this is something that society must support and stand behind it, science will also be hampered. Thank you. Joe, do you want to comment? Well, I, I'm an economist with social science, which is uh, some people uh, don't really think is a science at all. Uh, we, but we have a, a, a problem that is actually much worse than what you described, because uh, there are many people who are motivated not to believe the truth. So it's, you might say, uh, uh, good. If, if you're the Koch brothers and you have a lot of investments in coal, you have an incentive not to believe in climate change. And you have an incentive to try to convince uh, all Americans that climate change is not real. It's an inconvenient truth, but it's also a very costly truth. So there has been a, a wholesale assault on our institutions of science. Mm. And, um, this has been compounded by uh, two other factors going in. Uh, one is uh, the role of ideology, that, that uh, uh, at the core of economics is a belief that does uh, the market work. And that's very ideological. And those who want to believe in the free market do not want to look at evidence that's contrary to that. So you have a strong ideology, a little bit like the evolutionary uh, ideology, and in the United States there's a particular problem. A, a very large fraction of Americans still do not believe in evolution, just like they don't believe in climate uh, science. So uh, you have to overcome this ideology. And finally, there is this uh, populism today in the United States, where if you want to use that word, this notion that a large fraction of Americans have been left behind. And they associate that with an establishment, and that's you know, what yeah. you said, and they associate that establishment with a belief in these truth institutions, the universities, and a majority of the Republican Party in surveys think that universities are a bad thing. Yeah. Now, when you have a majority of one of the two parties thinking that 
the institutions of, of, of knowledge are undermining society and are a bad thing, you have a problem as a society. So that's fascinating. Yeah. Yes, please, quickly. Good. So, so Joe, um, you know, what seems to me to, to drive the American dynamic more than any other thing? I mean, obviously there's the bad actors who are in it, like the Koch brothers, because of it's their financial interest. But really, it seems to me that the thing that is most critical is the belief system in no tax, no regulation, free market economies. And that basically, if you're going to do something about climate change, firstly, you need taxes, and secondly, you need regulation. And this is why it is so deeply threatening to the, to the basic business American psyche. It, and, and that, to me, is a religion. Yeah, it, it is a religion, <laughs> and uh, I, almost immune to evidence. Uh, so right now we've been through this uh, big uh, thing about tax cuts. People appeal to supply side re uh, measures that this will stimulate the economy. We had an experiment, not a controlled experiment in the way that we were talking about earlier today, but you might say an experiment uh, under Reagan where we lowered taxes. There were predictions made what would happen, both at the macro level, what would happen to GDP, and at the micro level in terms of savings and labor supply. All those predictions were refuted. And yet, after all the evidence comes in, uh, they, the same arguments are brought out, yeah. and you say, how could they do that? And it comes to a I religion where it yeah. can't be refuted. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. you know, and here reality comes back in again. Reality will also hit this kind of religion. Yeah. Social reality, economic reality, the global reality of the world we live in with all its interconnected uh, financial streams, etc. At one point, it takes time, but at one point, it will hit back. Yeah, I, I hate to be a pessimist because my life has been about optimism and, and change, <laughs> but uh, we, we had the reality of the 2008-2009 crisis. I mean, you couldn't have more reality than that. And yet, the large number of particularly macroeconomists who believe in the same models that brought us to this crisis, that has not changed. That religion has, has been dented, yeah. but not fundamentally so, changed. Some of us say unkind things about economists because of that. <laughs> so, but, yeah. I, it, it, it's, it's very interesting, I think, there's kind of an attack on science. And, uh, uh, but also, I think there's an assumption within that whole establishment that science will solve the issue, will solve the problem. That's what's expected in medical science. You don't get much problem getting Republicans, for instance, to support biomedical research. They're all pretty stupid and they want to live forever. Okay? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> and, and, and so that, that's not an issue. They're, they're not really against science. They're against science, which is inconvenient to them. But the, the question I pose to them is, is, you know, we are enormously clever about science. We have a tremendous people, tremendous intellects. You heard what, that one of them earlier, uh, and of course the philosopher earlier who was Simon speaking. Simon Vernon. Yeah. Yes, and wonderful. But, when is the last time that we made it rain, and when is the last time that we made it stop raining? And I think that's where we should start. We are relatively powerless in the force of, in the face of can, nature. Can I just suggest that... that last actually, thing. Okay. <laughs> There's actually more of an anti-science uh, uh, deep in the, in the conservative uh, uh, movement. Uh, they don't want the collection of data that might counter their beliefs. Yeah. So they've actually been trying to suppress uh, science. And the most important thing was one of the things that was uh, emphasized this morning, which is knowledge is tentative. And the scientific knowledge uh, is, is tentative. And they're trying, I thought David put it very uh, well, we're competing with liars who are selling the notion of false confidence in the truth. And we're trying to explain that uh, w there is uncertainty, but there are certain things that we know are true <laughs> that climate change is very, very, very likely. Okay, if, let, if, the let, time, if the timekeeper lets it go, everything falls apart. Let, All right, let, last word to you, Helga, let, go on. Let me just quote Bernard Russell. He said the problem with the world is only fanatics and fundamentalists are always certain. Wise people have doubts. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs>